Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, and I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. My next book that I want to review is Dodge Tank, the Crystal Shards online series, book one. The author is Rick Scott. It's narrated by Eric Michael Sumnerer, and the audiobook length is a very short 10 hours and 18 minutes long. The best part of my sucky life is that I get to play Crystal Shards online for a living. Not a living, as in I make so much money playing that I don't have to work in the real world. More like playing Crystal Shards is the only work I can do. But I make the best of it. It's not a great living, for sure, but I earn enough to help pay the rent, buy food, and hopefully one day save up enough money to pay for my mom's operation. That's one reason my life sucks right now. My mom has been ill for a while. Radiation sickness from fallout debris, the doctors say. That's the other reason my life sucks. Most of the world was made uninhabitable by a nuclear war a couple centuries ago. They say one day we might be able to live on the surface again, but it probably won't happen in my lifetime. Now we live below ground, in cities carved out by giant automated boring machines called builders, City is a bit of a generous term for it, though. It's more like thousands of shipping containers linked together by tunnels. Uh, now, this book really needs a theme song. Giving an, given an existing one, I would pick the Cowboy Bebop theme, as it's just as frenetic as the book is, and it sounds great. Now, everything about this book is tinged with anime. I mean, just look at the cover. Take away the title, and you might think this was a Toonami program. Ryan, or Reese, the main character, could be about to throw down with Inuyasha or Naruto. The internal fighting feels the same way. And I'm not saying this in a negative way at all. I'm not trying to say it's only anime. The anime itself, anime only works really well where it fizzles out spectacularly. This book completely works. But it shouldn't. I don't do spoilers, but nothing I'm going to say won't be revealed in less than the first five minutes of the book. This book lays on the old lit RPG tropes like it was making a sandwich, okay? It is cliched and tropey. Uh, Reese, the protagonist, uh, his name is also Ryan in real life, lives in poverty, and his gaming is the only thing that keeps his family in food and shelter. But only just barely. I mean, just barely. They're just scrimping by. Trope number two is the sick relative. Uh, Ryan's mother is dying of cancer. Trope number three, the player himself, Reese or Ryan, he suffers from a physical ailment. Ryan has a gimpy leg, and this limits what he can do in both the real world and in the virtual one for some bizarre reason, because plot needs it. Okay? Uh, trope number four is the cute and supportive love interest. Ryan just so happens to work in the mines every day with a sexy mama, but he's just too focused on bringing home the bread to cook some bacon. Okay? Uh, trope number five. He has to win against the big boss, the world boss, at the end to save his family. Or his mother dies and they lose their home and so on and so forth. Now, there are a few more tropes or cliches I could throw at you, but you get the point, right? I mean, Scott almost made me put the book down because of all these things I've seen a hundred times by this point. The book also has a few other things that I hate going for it. The first is the game currency doubling as real world currency. I see it all the time. And then every book that I read with this as a plot device, I think that the writer is completely out of touch. Because, yes, I know Bitcoins are real, and there are several other types of cryptocurrency, but I will say this. No matter how much gold I ever earned in WoW, it never, never, never translated into my bank account accepting those kind of coins, okay? Honest to God, it was not money, it was not bread, it was not dough. It was electric bits of nothingness. And that's what these games really should just focus on and just leave this part alone. But again, plot device, okay? I really wish it had, but no. Now, the other flaw, and it's one I'm particularly loathe and I will not forgive later. All the other things, I'm going to let slide. This one, I am not, and I'm going to call it out, and I'm going to just call it like I see it, okay? I hate super leveling. I hate it. Lit RPG books have this all the time where the character super levels to extreme heights in a matter of days or weeks or whatever it would be. Here, Ryan literally levels 100 times in a matter of days. 
And if you count all the previous classes that he had to get to to become a ninja beforehand, um, he, he does at least 100 levels, at least. And he does it in less than a week. And he does it as a solo player. And, and this is what mind boggles me. On not less than three occasions before, he was told that the people around him would not help power level him. He had to learn to get to these levels on his own to play the world boss. And he does. He does it incredibly. Uh, so he gets to the max level in no time, practically. Now, he's not completely maxed out at the end when he does get to the, the, the final boss fight. Uh, he is a little short, but he's powerful enough to go in there. And, of course, you know how it goes, the story. I'm not going to spoil anything. But I, I get where this was going. But they could have done the same thing with keeping his levels a bit more realistic. Okay? Uh, I just hate power leveling or max powering or however you want to word this. It gets to be just a serious, stupefying thing. Because all I know is if I played a game and I could max myself out fully within a week, the game would bore me within three weeks. Okay. The second thing is, even though he levels up, he doesn't have any epic gear. He's buying stuff online with money that you know is not going to be the best he could have. So he might be the, the, the appropriate level, but he's not the appropriate power that he could be. Okay. Armor, gear, weapons, it's just not there. And some of that stuff they do get around a little bit, but for the most part, nope. Okay. So I get where Scott was going with this, but it, it just, the part pees me about this is that several characters really say they're not going to help him do it, and he does it anyway. So I've just listed like a huge boatload of issues that I have with this book. And yet, if you really listen to my final score, you're going to think I'm being inconsistent. Well, let me just say that while the tropes are the tropes, you forgive each one a little bit at a time. Again, it's plot points. There's reasons behind everything. Ryan is trying to become a dodge tank, flying by his head, okay? Um, and that is a person who accrues aggro, but doesn't get hit. Now, he, he does have a few devastating attacks, uh, but the ninja class is designed to basically gradually wear an opponent down. And the book, for me at least, really took off when Ryan fought Bathsheba, the giant cat. Uh, up until that point, the wheels were spinning, but there was no traction. After that point, the car had hit the ground running and was hauling butt like it was on fire. Each trope is resolved or managed, and it actually has a purpose that fits well into the story as things move forward. Best of all, the book derails the plans that it laid out so very carefully and takes you into a new territory. Now, I know I've probably done a review or two already that I say this is really bad, but here, this is into a, a place that you are not expecting and you really want to see more of. And I will tell you this, the book ends on a major cliffhanger, but at the end, as much as I say the power leveling was overwhelming and it left a bad taste in my mouth, you find out that even then, in this new place that he's going to go game, he is not strong enough and he needs to level more and he needs to level quickly or he's going to die for real. There is no second chances in this other game that he plays. Okay? And that is like... Another, I've said this before in another review, it's very matrixy. Um, it's where the real world meets the virtual world. And you don't really know how much of it's real, how much of it's not, but all you know is there you can die if you are killed. And so he's got to really focus on what he needs to do, and he's got friends with him that he really has to save and protect. Eric Michael Sumner really does a great job on the narration. There were one or two word snafus, but nothing that was unforgivable. I really enjoyed listening to him and anticipated his tackling the next book soon. Sound quality was really good, and he played each character with emotion and presence. Now, while it took me a little while to get into this book, it sank its claws into me and has yet to let me go. Now, I really cannot wait to see what happens next, and you won't either. So don't delay. Become a Dodge Tank fan today. Final score, 8.5 with points shaved off for the power leveling and making you want more ending. Okay, cliffhangers, I know people hate them. I don't mind them so much. But when you really just get into it and it's the meat and potatoes of the true story and you cut away or you pull that rug off underneath me, I've already waited to get to this book on audio. Now I've got to wait for it to hit the shelves again and then get the audio. So don't do that. I enjoyed it too much. It was too exciting and too much fun. Go out 
read this book and enjoy it. All right, my next book is Steel Alchemist, a lit RPG series. Author is Deck Davis. Narration is by Kevin Giese. And the audiobook length is 9 hours and 33 minutes. He just cut and measured and boiled, working with an intensity that he became utterly lost in until finally... That should do it, he said, holding out the vial of treacle brown liquid. He took a deep breath. His heart was hammering. Will it work? It'll either work or it'll kill her. Shouldn't you try it on something? There's no time. She hasn't got long. It's this or nothing. I'll pray to Gyodor, said Solly. Here we go. Faye's face curled up into a bestial snarl, but luckily Solly had tied her up while Jake worked, well before the dangerous demigoth symptoms could make their ugly appearance. She snarled and snapped at him with her teeth, clacking them together. Jake waited for her lips to open, and then he reached forward and tipped the liquid into her mouth. Then he sat back out of reach. The liquid seemed to have enraged her further, and she flailed around and she grunted until spit flew from her lips. Now, last time... I reviewed Deck Davis's book, The Arcane Survivalist, and now I find myself doing the same for his other book, and I wish I had read this book first, because I wouldn't have struggled so much to listen to the next one. Arcane Survivalist really, really left a bad taste in my mouth, and if I hadn't gotten these two books together at the same time, I would have completely stopped after Survivalist. But once I get the book, I, I insist that I read it, and I don't chicken out or wimp out. I got it, and I'm going to review it, and I'm going to listen to it. So this book does have a few more story issues than Survivalist, but the narration actually saves it. If I had to place a wager, I'd put money down that this was Davis's very first novel that he'd written. It may not have been the first one that he released, but I'm betting it was the first one that he put to paper. Um, you can see him making the effort, and he does steer his way through some very choppy, narration waters um plot holes are there and they're in the boat i mean he's in a boat and the plot holes are really leaking everywhere uh, but as a first effort if i'm correct it isn't too bad it's not great but not bad i'm guessing after having read blade mage beastmaster that i have higher expectations because i enjoyed that book uh, but that was by scott bennett with narration so i really kind of think that there's a there's a reason why i enjoyed that book more than the other ones the problem here that I have, aside from the story fluctuations, is that this also becomes one long, giant penis joke. Not funny ones, and also the MC, Steel, is rude. Not that they weren't rude in Arcane Survivalist, but I mean, if someone in need really wanted my help, and they came to me and spoke to me in the way that Steel speaks to everybody, they would go away empty-handed. No one in real life talks to other people like that. Not unless they want socked in the jaw. Not unless they want major disappointment from other people when they ask them for something. Nobody talks like that. I think that Davis has, again, he's got this 12-year-old mentality where he's, he's seen some smart-ass kid in his school get away with saying crap. And he thinks, boy, that kid's really funny. He's really cool. And every character he makes up is like that as a main character. And it is just really, really annoying. Uh, now, I will say this, which is funny. I hated the title Blade Mage Beastmaster, but I enjoyed the book. I loved the titles Arcane Survivalist and Still Alchemist, but did not enjoy them so much. And again, I will say this. Davis can come up with some really catchy titles. My issue with these books is that they just weren't polished, and they were overwhelmed by potty humor, and completely, I mean utterly, completely unlikable characters. But I like to think he's improving. Like I said, if you read Blade Mage, there's a step up, and that could just be the Scott Bennett's amazing narration, but it's a step up. With Alchemist, I will say that Geesey almost manages to save the story. There is emotion and tension, and this is read as if it came from a person rather than a tree, as in Arcane Survivalist. Uh, he manages to make this book bearable. And at no point did I pray for this book to end like I did Arcane Survivalist. I just prayed for it to end. 
And I didn't switch out to another book just to keep my head on straight. And I credit that to Kevin Giese, whose narration was like some aloe vera on a very extreme sunburn. Now, I'm not going to tell you to stay away from this book. It does have redeeming qualities. And the narration does take it a long way. And you really might enjoy it. I just hope that the bathroom humor gets erased or curtailed from here on out because it's not funny. And I think it detracts from the story. It detracts from the characterizations of the main characters. It becomes very unbelievable because no one, even my best friend and I, when we were growing up, did not talk like that to each other other than maybe once or twice as an intro or an exit to each other. You know, you, you say some smart out looky thing and then they, they throw it back at you. You know, your mama this or, you know, you look like this. But you move on. You don't do that for 18 hours a day. And everybody in these books that he's written, Survivalist and Steel Optimist, does this incessantly. They don't stop. And that was really the deciding factor for the final score. The final score is a 4 out of 10. I could actually go as high as 5 because it is bearable. It's not bad. It's bearable. But it's only because of the narration elevating this piece to something that it needed to be. This is one of those points where they say a good narrator can take a good story and make it great, and a great narrator can take a good story and make it a masterpiece. This is a story point where you have a decent narrator, and he gives you a decent story. Uh, so I, I'm going to let you decide when you listen to it, whether it's a 4 or 5. For me, it's a 4. I could say 4.5, but I'm sticking to my guns on this. The only thing that had any redemption to it at all is the narration. The story does have plot holes. It does have a lot of bad characterizations, and there's no character development. I mean, if you want to look at the overall truth of it, the characters do not change or grow, and they don't learn anything. There is no learning going on at all. So that's my issues with the book. So four out of ten, and again, I'm going to apologize to Deck Davis, and I'm going to stay away from his books for a while uh, and just kind of give him a break because it's not fair for me to sound like I'm beating up on him, even though I've reviewed both these books. No, baby, don't don't be that way. I mean, you know, it was just another done. I was only holding her for a second. Hi, guys. Welcome back. Uh, you're probably wondering what I was doing right there. Nothing. The uh, only thing I'm doing is I'm reviewing Gunmeister Online, Adult and Uncensored. Uh, the author is Noah Barnett. And the narration is done by Annie Ellicott, Justin Thomas James, and Jeff Hayes. The audio book length is 14 hours and 13 minutes, and it's a little long. I think that it could have been a 12-hour book, and it would have been solid as it was. Northern Yankees are yellow-bellied! They is yellow-bellied and sissies, Monty reminded him. Well, you'll just have to forgive me. Monty was smiling as he pulled a gray cloth over his face and crouched next to the burn pile. A long bayonet was already fixed to his Kentucky long rifle. Another branch snapped as a woman with outrageously huge breasts ran down the valley floor toward them. She held a Tavor S.A.R. bullpup rifle against her bouncing chest. The second woman was more modestly built with athletic runner's legs and carried a modified M4A1 assault rifle. Both girls slowed to a trot, sensing the trap, but the call of blood was too compelling to ignore. At the last second, Monty rose from his crouch and leaped forward. For the South, he shouted, skewering the large-breasted girl. She made a strange sound and flailed on the end of his weapon. Bullets slammed into the ground as she squeezed the trigger. Blood gurgled from her lips, and she released her rifle to claw at the steel blade in her chest. So it does have a bit of a lengthy process to it. Uh, you, it won't feel overly long, but it could have been trimmed back and been a little bit tighter and been a little bit quicker. Uh, the, the big part for me that slowed it down was jumping into the other games rather than the main game, Gunmeister Online. And I understand the point to it, but it took it a little while to get through. Uh, so that was my big issue with the timing. Now I have to admit, this is one of those books, and I, I really want to be honest with you, I don't read books. I don't have time. Uh, and if I do have time to sit down and take five minutes, I usually write a review and get it out so that I can repay the author's for writing something amazing and making me happy. So I listen to audio, 
And as soon as I saw this book come out, I was really concerned because not all the books that I want to read, or I should say listen to, make it to Audible. And this is one of those ones I was really, I was, I was praying to see it happen. Um, so my joy was that it did, it did come true, okay? Um, and one of the things that kind of bothered me was is we didn't get the mature cut. Uh, I think that you're, you're talking about a gun book, and it's going to have a ton of violence. Uh, there's going to be murders and, and everything else, but we can't talk about sex. Uh, not that I'm like overly into sex books, you, you know. You would think so by the way I talk about like uh, J. A. Ciparino or you know uh, the, the stuff that you know Harmon Cooper writes with Cherry Blossom Girls and that sort of thing. Uh, I do enjoy that sort of stuff. I'm an adult. I'm an, I'm a male, but it's not something that makes or breaks it for me with a book. Uh, but here, you know, to cut it back, it just kind of kind of seems silly, especially when you have a place where you're getting you know, people shot to pieces. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to say Barnett was a really smart guy. And he went through Sound Booth Theater. In this case, he got not one, but three incredible narrators. He got Annie Ellicott, the man with three first names, Justin Thomas James, and the ever amazing Jeff Hayes. And I'm going to come right out and say this, guys. I am a Jeff Hayes fanboy. I have been since the very first book that I listened to that was lit RPG was a Jeff Hayes book. And Everything that I've heard from him since has done nothing but impress me. So I'm always going to say with total honesty, yep, I'm a big fanboy for Jeff, but if he makes a mistake, I'm going to come out and say it. And when I get to my Reapers and Repercussions, uh, the, the Feedback Loop Book 4 review, you'll see I do call him out on an error that he has. Uh, but otherwise, that's just me being honest with you, okay? Here, the three of them really worked their butts off and give you some of the best vocal readings I've ever heard. Uh, this book is kind of like a reverse of their usual work, as Hayes generally reads the bulk of the story, and, and Annie backs him up with her female voices. Here, however, Annie gets her gun, finally. She is given the lead, and she takes the lead. She takes it into a whole new direction. Uh, Jeff does most of the male voices, but James locks and loads in, as a backup on one other voice as a southern gentleman and he nails the character i mean just flat out nails it so you've got jeff annie and justin all crushing their jobs okay and this is the triple thread of narration right here uh, i just don't know how you can get any better and i'm going to say i really hope that justin does more work in the future just as annie deserves to get more work uh, on her own or at least as leads because these two are right up there with super talented people in the field. I would say Luke Daniels, Jeff Hayes, those sorts of people. They're getting close to being able to say they're that good. Um, anyway, this this clever, uh, combination of voices really feels like it's an alternation of mortar shells and napalm being dropped on your eardrums. You just don't know what hits you after a while. It's one thing after another. Pow, 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 pow. It's intense, and it is incredible. And you really see that Annie brings more to the table than you would believe, okay? Now, how about Barnett's writing? Well, as a fledging author, this cat has really got it together. He does know how to pace a plot, and he knows how to build tension, and he adds humor in where humor is needed. And he doesn't hold back on the big story. There's a lot more going on here than a guy just rotating in and out of death duels with a gun he pretty much is creative with his gaming system. The players don't build up. Their weapons do. Okay? This is a first. The characters don't increase in their power. Their weapons do. They actually get to add more guns into their catalog as they move along and get more powerful. Uh, this is a gun venture that you really have never seen before. Uh, the weapons are sentient and they require physical love, hence me talking to my nice little gun here, uh, in order for them to bond with you and to stay with you as a player in the future. And if you don't treat them right, they will walk away, even if they bonded with you very tightly. So it's it's a whole new concept. It's pretty slick. And I really appreciated the whole idea. And I, I found it out that it was it was I found out that it was rather humorous that out of the whole game where there's M16s and different types of rifles and you know snipers and that sort of thing, there's one dude just one guy who's like, nope, screw it. I'm carrying a flintlock, and I'm going to be totally a bad grass mofo with it. 
Okay, because I could see my father being that guy. My dad would say, I'm carrying a flintlock and I'm going to call myself Hawkeye. And he would he would kick butt with just a, you know, single load, you know, power gun. So this was pretty slick. Okay, and there's one guy that he absolutely steadfastly refuses to carry a gun. He carries a sword for the longest time. And it's just one of those things where you have to laugh and say, yeah, yeah I could see somebody else doing that as well. Uh, and the action scenes here, they do not feel like Michael Bay stupid type of action scenes. This is more of a diehard first and second movie type of action that you will enjoy. The big fights are brutal and fun, and there are three really big fights. And I must say, I was glad to have so much content. Anything over seven or eight hours of runtime is a blessing, but if it's not done right, it can hurt. And like I said, this had probably double what I just said, seven or eight hours, and it could have been trimmed back a little bit more, but I appreciated the more uh, information and the more characterization and the more story that we received in that extra time. It was worth it, and I'm not complaining about the 14 hours. Now, I have to warn you, you are going to feel bullets zip by and feel shrapnel spatter your face, and you will fall in love with Elva, the main character's gun. Uh, the first gun, and you will wish you could just holster her just one time. I may just put her in your holster and go. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, this is a frantic and frenetic story that locks and loads you in and never lets you back up. You will be pinned down by cover fire, and you will have no chance of backup coming to save you. The only thing is, is you're not going to want to be rescued. You'll want to join the fun and deal out your own grievous head wounds of your own. My final final uh, grade for this book is going to be a 7.5 and that's only because uh, there is about two hours that could have been trimmed back a little bit I really as much as I enjoyed the other game it could have been cut back or shown in another way and another flaw was we get a lot of real world stuff and there's a lot of significance and importance attributed to what goes on in the real world and then that kind of goes by the wayside about three quarters of the way the book in. And you never really hear about it again. I mean, seriously, there's job issues, there's love issues, and just pow, 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 pow. All those things just kind of go up in smoke. And the big problem for me was the direction that the book took at the end. If the book had stayed on course all the way through, I mean, you've got really great sights and the targets right there. Why would you fire this direction after you're about done? It doesn't make sense. So those right there, I'm going to give it a 7.5 because he, he does go off in a different direction. The book does drag in a different game, and it's not as exciting as Gunmeister. And like I said, there's about two hours of points that you can just go with and just cut out, and it'd be fantastic. So 7.5, but it really, really, really feels like an 8, 8.5. So you will enjoy this book regardless of what my score is. Okay, final score or not, it's a great read, and I really recommend it, and you'll have fun, and you will not be able to wait till the next book comes out.